let me yeah so thank you once again and good evening everybody uh, before i start let me first uh, really extend my hearty thanks to the organizers of uh, uh, indian women's scientists association for this uh, commendable job they are doing that is promoting science uh, education to different faculties of uh, colleges and students so i my association with uh, uh, this uh, women science women scientist association indian women scientist association iwsa uh, is for quite some time now and it is all because uh, of uh, dr lalita dharishar whom i fondly call dharishar ma'am so she uh, invited me for a lecture uh, i think 3 or 4 years back uh, when uh, before pandemic of course so there i he she requested me to deliver a talk on lasers in medicine so i went there to your institute advasi and i think i i i uh, i was there for uh, the entire day and i delivered the talk so thank you dharishar ma'am specially for inviting me once again for and you have uh, have been very affectionate towards me always so thank you ma'am so uh, as you all know today i'll be talking on optical tweezers the topic is optical tweezers the force of light in making revolution in micro manipulation now before i start Uh, let me tell you about the institute i am from as uh, already uh, it has been told that it is raja ramanna center for advanced technology indore so it is a unit of department of atomic energy government of india engaged in research and development in non nuclear front line research areas of lasers particle accelerators and related technologies the motto of uh, our center rrcat whom which we call rr cat is photons in the service of mankind so there are two mandates of our center one is uh, particle accelerators and another is lasers now as you all know that rr cat is home to india's only synchrotron radiation source they are called indus 1 and indus 2 so they are national facilities indus 1 is a 450 mega electron volt 100 million kilo electron storage ring emitting radiation from mid infrared to soft x ray with a critical wavelength of 61 armstrong and in the stu is a 2.5 gv electron storage ring designed for the production of x rays so researchers from across india they come to ararcat for using these facilities for using several beam lines for their research in material science in biology and many other stuff and lasers the center is involved in the development of variety of laser systems and their utilization for applications in industry medicine research etc so uh, we have been we at our cat have been doing research on these two uh, main areas apart from others now there is a uh, group called laser biomedical application division which uh, i head now at present so is this laser biomedical application division one important mandate of ours is research and development on the use of optical spectroscopy and imaging to advance the diagnosis of cancer and other diseases like tuberculosis malaria etc so we use various principles of physical sciences for example you may be aware fluorescence diffuse reflectance and raman spectroscopy another thing is that optical coherence tomography many of you might be knowing it now because uh, this is an imaging technique and mostly used in ophthalmology there are this is uh, abbreviated as oct and other thing is that optical tweezers and micro manipulations so we have been actively pursuing uh, research on these three things to solve the problems of 
medicine and biology. And we have been using uh, samples, intact tissues, both in vitro and in vivo, cells and body fluids as well. And in the process, uh, in, in doing research, in, in, in the pers pursuing this research, we have, in the course of pursuing this research, we have developed, uh, we have not only published papers to various peer-reviewed international and national journals, but also uh, have been able to really yield deliverables in the form of products, point of care devices, which are, which have been, uh, whose technologies have been transferred to industries and they have been uh, in use across the country. For example, there is, we have developed one uh, cancer diagnostic machine called Onco Diagnoscope. If you Google search it, you will be able to find information about it then we have Oncovision, then we have a Raman probe, then we have tuberculoscope. So all these devices, uh, you can Google search and you'll be having information on that. But today uh, I'll be talking on optical tweezers. So I will not be deliberating on all those things, but on optical tweezers. So as you know that uh, light, whether light can exert force, that is the question, you know. So this question was basically thought first by Kepler in 17th century AD. And wh why he thought it is because he was observing, he was a German astronomer, as you all, all of you know. So Johannes Kepler, he was a German astronomer. So he was observing uh, the planetary motion and particularly the motion of a planet around the sun. And in doing so, what he observed that comet's tail is always pointing away from the sun. So he was quite puzzled. He wanted some explanation. And what he could imagine at that time is that he thought and he rightly thought that that light might be exerting some force. And that's why the comet tail is away from the sun. That means sun rays are basically pushing the comet tail at the opposite direction. And so there was no proof at that point in time, but it was until Einstein discovered this photoelectric effect where the particle nature of light was established. You, as, as you all know, that light is made up of photons. So these photons, Einstein showed that they can basically eject electrons from a metal surface. So until that point in time, particle nature of light was not established. So that means that light has sufficient force. They can really, really, uh, that, that, that has energy, that kind of energy, which can really eject electrons out of the metal surface. So this, after this particle nature of light was established, then you can you, you can think and you can always now, now you know that say for example, this is a laser and laser, you can know that this laser beam is nothing but a beam of foot, uh, a stream of photons. It is just like, you know, that water jet and it, it, you can see in this picture that a water jet is moving uh, up and a ball is being held there at the water. And this water force, these water molecules, they are pushing the ball afloat. That's why the ball is afloat. So, so that is the thing which is there. That means light can really exert force. Now, before, so so so, what is what is uh, if if it is a force, then you know that force per unit area is pressure. So, light. All of you sitting in this in the in your respective rooms under uh, this uh, tube light illumination, you are basically experiencing that force. But that force is not large enough that you can really feel it. So let us go, how, let us see how it happens. So before that, let me define what is radiation pressure. You know that pressure, pressure from the very physics uh, or high school physics, we know that pressure is nothing but force per unit area. Now force, as you know, that it is a rate of change of momentum, dp by dt from Newton's laws. And now for a photon, this momentum 
this P is nothing but energy upon C. That is from the famous Einstein's equation for relativistic particle, E square is equal to P square, C square as P is the momentum, C is the speed of light, M0 is the rest mass of the particle and C is again the speed of light. So from this equation, uh, you can easily get the momentum of photon. Why? Because you, as all of you know, that rest mass of photon is zero. So E square is equal to P squared, C squared, so E is equal to PC. From that you get P is equal to E by C. Now, if you put back this, uh, P is equal to U by C in the force per unit area. So then pressure is equal to dP by dt per unit area. If you uh, if you just uh, put the values of P in terms of energy, so d e dt by area upon C. So if you calculate, so radiation pressure becomes power of light upon the speed of light per unit area. So this is the expression of radiation pressure from your high school physics. Okay, now. This radiation pressure, uh, after deriving this radiation pressure, let us see this, this force of light has been, this magic of this optical force has been shown in various sci-fi movies. All of you are aware this, uh, you know, that recent movie in Avengers Infinity War of uh, directed by Russo brothers in 2018, there they have used or they have shown how this optical force can, can be used to uh, as a kind of magical force to really hold objects. Okay, so you you, you might have seen all this uh, in this movie, and as well as in Star Wars, in uh, uh, which is even now being aired, and Star Trek, and many more movies, sci-fi movies, they have shown uh, this optical force as a kind of miracle kind of thing. Now let us see. Let, let me let me tell you what what is there. Say, for example, the question comes: whatever has been shown in these sci-fi movies that it, you, you you can use light, and they have used light. They have shown that we using light. Uh, the captains, or uh, uh, say, for example, here this this uh, black border skew ships, this skew ship of Evanoi Mayo, Mo, and Carl Obsidian, they they actually use light to to, to really lift a unconscious doctor strange. So you, you, you just see this movie once, once, then you will understand what I'm say, saying. So this is a, roughly a kind of picture from this, uh, uh, this uh, Avenger. So what is there? So they have shown that this kind of, this is, this is the kind of thing light can do. For example, light can do like this, okay? So they have shown in the, their movies, okay? So in many, very many movies, they have used in some form or other this kind of thing. So let us see whether this light can really pick up this kind of uh, large objects like human beings. Now for that, let us see what physics says. Now, assuming laser power, laser of uh, power of one watt and area of one micron, micron square, radiation pressure, if you calculate, it comes out to be three piconewton per micron micrometer square. Okay, because radiation pressure is nothing but power upon C by area. If you just calculate, you will find. Now for one micron particle of mass, you know that it is a mass of around five into 10 to the one minus 16 kg and area roughly you can take as one micron square. Then, and gravity, as you know that F is equal to M into, M into G, mass of the particle into the acceleration due to gravity, then it comes out to be 0 0.005 piconewton. You can as well calculate on your own. Whereas light force is, you can calculate it could be, it will be, it will come out to be around three piconewton, which is much, much less than order of magnitude less than gravity. Okay. So that means light force really can be appreciable for one micron particle. Whereas for the human, if I calculate, Say for example, the human in that Avenger film, mass of 70 kg if we can, if we assume an area of 100 centimeters square, then gravity or the gravitational force acting on that person is around 70 Newton. But as optical force, you can calculate, it is only 10 milli Newton. That is much, much less than gravity. So no way you can really lift that person against the force of gravity. That means, light will not have that much force which is appreciable or which will be sufficient to really pull him up. 
So that means what is happened, optical forces are not significant for larger objects like human beings. The calculation, the physics shows, because since optical force is much, much less than gravity. So what will happen, the person will eventually fall. It will not, it will, he will not be able to, light will not be able to lift him up. So the clip in that science fiction movie is far from reality. So they have just, it is a, a fig of imagination, but, optical forces can be significant for microscopic objects where gravity is much, much less than optical force as we, as we have seen already. Now, this realization of these finding of physics, you know, Arthur Askin, as he got the Nobel Prize in 2018, he first showed, he first realized, or he first uh, realized through first theoretical calculations that optical forces can be significant for microscopic objects like biological cells as I have rightly, uh, as I have shown if, uh, in the previous slide. So he is the person, he's the first person who did this and that gave birth of optical tweezers. Okay, so that was the time when optical tweezers were, were, was born. And it is a tool, he, he showed that it can be a, it can be used as a tool for manipulation of microscopic objects using the forces of light. And various microscopic objects he experimented with and later many groups in the world, including ours have experimented on live cells, single cells like normal cells, cancerous cells, blood cells, okay? So we'll be seeing how it happened. Now, before proceeding, you know that all of we, we all know that what light is from, this is our high school physics. Again, light is an electromagnetic wave with oscillating electric and magnetic fields. Both are perpendicular to each other and also perpendicular to the direction of propagation. So that is how we perceive that light is, we know from physics. Now, you know that for all practical purposes, always in physics, and you have seen that in your high school physics, you have always used or you have always assumed light to be made up of electric fields. Why it is so? The natural question comes, why light is always, we assume that light, when we talk about, talk about light and physics, we say, we say that let us uh, uh, have an electric field E. So this is because you know that this permittivity, there are two parameters which come from famous Maxwell's equations permittivity and permeability. Permittivity, epsilon, it is denoted by epsilon, and permeability, mu. So they are, well, uh, permittivity is a measure of electric polarizability and permeability is a measure of magnetization. So for water, glass, biological cells, or all the objects we deal with, epsilon, that is the permittivity, is much, much greater than mu. So for all practical purposes, only electric field effects are significant. So that's why light is always, we call, when we talk about physics of light, we only consider electric field, okay? Now, now we know that force, light exerts force, that we have understood. Now, this, this force we call optical forces, there are two kinds, attractive and repulsive, okay? This attractive force, is also called a gradient force. And the repulsive force is, uh, this, this force is basically because of scattering force. So what happens, you know, that there is a potential well, this kind of thing, when you focus a light, so there is a kind of potential well, and any particle, if it comes, so it will fall through that thing and it will come to the focal spot. Whereas, the scattering, because it is attractive, gradient force will pull this particle. Whereas the scattering force, it is the just opposite of this potential well, and it will, that you can see that particle is falling away. So the scattering force basically pushes the particle away from the beam or light, light beam, whereas gradient force will pull this towards the focus of the beam. So that is how, uh, we'll see how it happens. Now, situation one could be scattering force that is the force which pushes the particle away is greater than gradient force. Then what will happen? Say, for example, you have set up a kind of trap or you have focused the laser beam or light beam somewhere here. And 
there is a bunch of particles, they are undergoing Brownian motion. Okay. Now you can see that scattering force is more. So what will happen? They will come, they will come here. They, uh, this, this beam, they will come to the focal, focal spot, but they will not be remaining there because the scattering force will push it away. So no optical trapping is possible because scattering force is greater than gradient force. As I told you that gradient force is the attractive force which will attract the particle to the focus of the beam, whether the scattering force will try to push it away from the focal spot. So it is happening like that and no optical trapping is possible. Now let us see situation two. Gradient force, that is the attractive force, is greater than the scattering force. Now in the same uh, assembly of particles which are undergoing Brownian motion, now you can see that they are, they, they, they are, it, it, it is being trapped. The particle can be trapped because gradient force will pull it towards the focus. And when they are, see, it is undergoing some kind of simple harmonic motion, okay? And because of Brownian motion, because Brown, you have to overcome the Brownian motion. So this restoring force, which is, you know, that from Hooke's law, from physics of uh, high school physics, F is equal to minus k dot x. This, this is basically the gradient force which tries to restore its position towards the focal spot. And stable optical trapping is possible when only this condition is fulfilled that gradient force is greater than the scattering force, okay? Now, let us little bit deviate from, uh, a little, little, little bit to learn from uh, physics, understanding from electrodynamics or electromagnetic theory. So you know that when you shine light, as I told you, light is electric field. Uh, so uh, electromagnetic field. So electric field is we can uh, consider. So it will, and um, it will, it will basically uh, cause separation of charges. And when separation of charges occurs, it is called electric dipoles are formed. Positive and negative charges are separated from each other when you shine light beam. Now, in a laser, in a laser beam. You know, it, 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 you, if you see the laser beam, then if you try to focus it, then you will find that laser beam has an intensity profile at the focal spot. That means it is highest at the center and gradually the intensity wins away at the periphery. Okay, so this is like bell shaped curve or Gaussian distribution. Okay, now that means there is non uniform electric field. Okay. So non-uniform electric field means this, this is the region of the center. So where electric field, uh, where, where there is uh, uh, intensity is more, whereas intensity is waning away. So if a dipole is uh, placed in this kind of non-uniform electric field, so it will experience two unequal forces. Had it been a uniform electric field, you know that QE and minus QE and plus QE, that is the force acting on these two charges, they will be same and it will, the dipole will rotate in that field. But if the field is non-uniform as the case here is in laser beam, uh, focal spot of the laser, so it is a non-uniform electric field. And in that case, what will happen that there will be a, one, one force will be more and another force will be less. And now if we see, so what will happen? You know that U, U is the potential. It potential is minus P dot E. It is P is the dipole moment and E is the electric field. And P is alpha into E, alpha is the polarizability and electric field. So, and force is nothing but the gradient of this electric potential, okay? Now, if I replace E here, so force becomes proportional to minus of E square, grad E square. And E square is nothing but ele electric field square is nothing but intensity. So minus grad of I, what is what does this mathematical things say? That means this grad of I means there should be a variation in intensity. If the intensity is non-uniform or varying, or it is a gradient of intensity, then only uh, you what will happen is there will be a net force acting towards the field where uh, towards the stronger strong, stronger field. Okay. So that is what is happening. So in this gradient of intensity is there because the intensity is more at the center and slowly diminishes at the periphery. So there is a gradient of intensity which is required to have an effective force. 
Okay, since this gradient force arises from the gradient of intensity, this gradient force which you have seen in uh, uh, as an attractive force, this is this arises because of this gradient of intensity. Okay, now let us try to understand it from ray optics. Very simple from our uh, high school physics again. Say for example, there a light. If there is a it is a it is a kind of dielectric particle and light beam is falling okay and then light beam will be you know that it will be reflected always there is there will be reflection and say for example the incident light has a momentum called pi is equal to h upon lambda h is Planck's constant lambda is the wavelength of light and pf is the uh, the final momentum that is the reflected beam momentum Okay, now what will happen? Now, say for example, so what will happen? This, this reflection, this reflection, uh, this reflection will cause a change in momentum. This change in momentum is nothing but del P, you know, momentum is a vector quantity. So it will have a direction as well as magnitude. So del, del P will be along the arrow. Okay, if you can calculate from your, again, I will say high school physics. So so when there, there will be, you know, that change in momentum is nothing but force, okay? So from Newton's third law, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So you will have, so since the force is acting, since the change of momentum is towards this, the force will also will be uh, uh, towards this direction. So an equal and opposite force will be acting towards this thing, towards this direction, which is shown as the red arrow. Now, similar, another beam, and there will be, again, uh, uh, this kind of force, which will be acting here because of this light being falling on here and ref getting reflected. So what will happen? The resultant of this force will pull the particle away from the beam. So that is called F scattering. So that is the scattering force. And then that's why you just see, that is why the particle is pushed away. So now I, we understand from ray optics that why scattering force is basically a repulsive force because there is change in momentum by photon on reflection. Okay, so that that is basically giving rise to scattering force. Now, another thing. Let us see how gradient force works. Now, say the beam is uh, light beam is falling on falling on this particle, and then there will be reflection. Refraction. You know, from your high school physics, there is reflection as well as refraction. Some most of the light is reflected, and but a portion of light is also refracted. So, since it is a lighter medium, denser, and it is a denser medium, so light will be bending towards, and then again it will be bending away from the normal. So, if you draw the normal here, so it will be bending away. So, this is the final thing. And now, the change of momentum. What is the change of momentum here? Let us see. Change of momentum is del p, and direction of del p is here. Okay. Now, say for another beam. So the focus of this laser, uh, this beam, light beam, is somewhere here because they're intersecting. Now, see what, what happens to this this beam. So if I do this thing, so you'll see that again, delta p is there, and it is it is there in this direction. So according to Newton's third, uh, uh, so uh, following Newton's third law of motion, so there will be this force here due to this equal and opposite, and there will be this force there equal and opposite. Okay. Now, so the result it will be somewhere along the or towards the focus. So what will happen? So this is called a gradient. This resultant of the two forces is a gradient. So what will happen? The particle will be pushed towards, say for example, the particle will be pushed towards the focal spot due to this gradient force. That's why this gradient force is called attractive force. Now here what is happening? Change in momentum and photon on refraction, which will give rise to gradient force. Okay, the beam has to it. that is that the beam has to pass through that particle, then only it is possible. Okay, the gradient force, otherwise gradient force will not exist. Okay, it will only if you, uh, if you, uh, if, if you shine light, then it will be only scattering force then if the no light is refracted. Okay, so what will happen, this object feels the force towards focus that is called actual gradient force. And this force is nothing proportional to grad I, which you have shown in the previous slide. Grad, grad I means the change in I. So this force originates because of this change in intensity. 
So there, sh there must be, there will have to be change in intensity, then only gradient force will occur, okay? Now, now say for example, the beam or, or the particle has been towards the, has been uh, uh, due to this gradient force, the actual gradient force, the, uh, the particle has been here in the focus, but not exactly at the focus, but somewhere uh, upside or in the dim ray area, because you know that uh, in, at the focus spot, there is a change in intensity. Okay, so what will happen then? So let us see, there is a bright ray. So this bright ray will have change in momentum towards this direction. And then dim ray, say for example, there will be having this kind of change in momentum. Okay, del P and del P, but this, this uh, width of this uh, arrow basically signifies the magnitude of the force. So dim arrow, the dim light has a uh, width less, I have shown it here just like that. So resultant will be somewhere here towards the strong force, okay? So what will happen? The light will be pulled towards the brighter area. So no matter how you focus light, uh, the, the beam will always be at the highest focus, uh, highest uh, intensity uh, position, okay? So object feels a force toward brighter light. So that is what is called lateral gradient force, okay? Beam intensity profile or beam distribution due to. Now, let us summarize what, what we have learned till now. So summary of optical trapping. So we now on, we have understood that for optical trapping, we have to, optical trap is, can be found by tight focusing of laser beam, which is nothing but sharp intensity gradient over tiny spatial dimensions, micron region, okay? And how it is possible? objective lens of high numerical aperture. I will come to this thing. You just now, uh, just uh, now uh, take, take it from me that it is possible with the objective lens or lens of high numerical aperture, okay? That, that will focus the laser beam into very tightly. Now, what we have learned, optical force arises due to transfer of momentum by scattering of incident photons, either through reflection or refraction. Both are scattering of photons. Scattering means what? Scattering of photons means change in direction of the photon from the initial direction to the final direction or in, in other direction. So in reflection also change of direction takes place. In refraction also change of direction takes place. So both are scattering. And this optical force, both repulsive, that is the scattering force and the attractive, that is the gradient force, basically arise from the transfer of momentum. Okay. Okay. Now, Optical force we have seen two components as scattering force along direction of light propagation and change in momentum is associated with reflection or absorption. Okay, both will give you scattering force and which will push your particle away from the laser beam. Whereas gradient force arises or it is along the direction of the spatial light gradient and change in momentum is associated with refraction. So refraction has to take place for gradient force to be present. So that is the thing. So this is what we have learned till now. Now let us see. So I told you that this is objective lens of high numerical aperture will tightly focus the laser beam. So how, what is numerical aperture? Why lens of with high numerical aperture? First, let us see what is numerical aperture. Numerical aperture is defined as N sine theta. So whereas theta, say for example, this is the lens and this is the optic axis of the lens and this is the beam getting focused, okay, at two different points. Say, for example, they have different focal length. Let us imagine. Now, theta is the angle which it makes, this ray makes, with respect to the optic axis. So, and N is a refractive index of the surrounding medium where the lens is placed. So, for lens placed in air, refractive index, this numerical aperture, the numerical aperture, what it shows? It shows the light gathering power, okay? So if lens of higher focal length will have low numerical aperture, whereas a lens with low focal length will have high numerical aperture. So maximum numerical aperture is one if the lens is placed in air. You can see one into sine theta, sine theta maximum value is one when it is theta is equal to 90 degree, okay? So sine theta max is equal to one. So if I plot this thing, so intensity versus the spatial position, so you can see that for low focal length, for high focal length lens, this, this is a flat profile. That means 
intensity gradient is not sharp, whereas high uh, uh, low focal length range or numerical aperture is more, there is a sharp this, this uh, uh, profile, intensity profile. That means sharp gradient, change in gradient, uh, change, change in intensity is very sharp, okay? So this is what is required for optical trapping. So that is, a, that, is a, that is what physics says. Now for optical trapping, normally we use objective with numerical aperture of 1.3 to 1.4. And the question comes how it is possible. As I've told right now that main maximum is one, but, but remember that I have told it because for lens placed in air where n air refractive index is one, n. But if I can choose to put this lens in any medium where n is higher, say for example, oil. So I can easily get refract numerical aperture more than one. So that is what we do. And oil immersion lens is the lens which is used for that, okay? So these lenses are having high numerical aperture. Now, summary of optical strapping from understanding from ray optics. So we have seen that F is equal to F scattering plus F gradient, total force acting on this uh, 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 say, for example, this kind of particle, F gradient acting towards focus, that is the restoring force. And F gradient is, should be greater than F scattering or scattering force for optical trapping to be possible. And it will lead to an optical potential well, as I have shown in previous slides. One of the slides I, shown, I had shown. Now, uh, you should remember this range of optical forces. You may wonder what this range of optical forces could be they are measured to be around piconewton, tens of piconewton. Piconewton means 10 to the power minus 12 newton, okay? And particle size could be tens of nanometer to micrometer. So these are the facts or these are the things which are associated with the optical tweezer. Now, since this is the thing, so this kind of optical tweezer or the optical force is significant in the scale of micromolecules organelles and even whole cells, okay? So what is ha what happens now for the optical trapping? So you focus this laser beam, this is the lens, high NN lens, you are focusing the laser beam. Now there is, a, there is a focus, this is the focal spot, but due to refraction, it is happening like this. And then what is happening? So there is a net force, gradient force acting uh, on it, and uh, it is pulling uh, the particle towards the focus. I have not shown the scattering force which will push because F gradient is more than F scattering, okay? So this is what is op optical trapping, the physics of optical trapping. Now, now let us uh, see how Professor Arthur Askin, how he basically did this, all these things, the historical development, so-called historical development, okay? Now, let me chronologically put the things in to, to put the things in into place okay so in 1970 he first demonstrated radiation pressure before that he just theoretically calculated that radiation pressure could be appreciable for tiny particles okay not of humans so from that radiation pressure calculation so he theoretically predicted and he demonstrated through experiment where he what he did he put a light beam, he tightly focused this light beam. It is a laser beam. It is a Gaussian profile. It is called beam waste. And there is a part, there is a suspension of micro particles which he took. And he observed through filter the what is happening here. So he, he, he saw that light is basically pushing this particle away from the, away from it. Okay, so that he, first time he, Establish that okay, light can exert force, and he force per unit area is radiation pressure, radiation pressure. So he demonstrated in 1970. So after successful demonstration of this thing, what happened in 1970? In the later part of 1970, he thought that okay, if a particle, how I can overcome this uh, scattering force? How can I make the particle? Uh, uh, fixed in its position. So he conceived that time in what came to his mind and all we all know that the, uh, I mean, two equal and opposite forces, if I uh, apply, then we can really nullify the forces and the particle will be at rest. So that is what he did. He put a laser beam from beam one and beam two from the opposite direction 
and he showed that particle can be at rest or it can be trapped. So this is a two beam optical trap. He first demonstrated and he first experimentally realized this two beam optical trap. Okay, so it is very, uh, I mean, logically he was correct. Now, in 1977, okay, he, 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 he was thinking in his mind, he was brooding over the thing that how with a single beam I can do this. So what he did, he somehow conceived the idea of levitation trap, gravitation levitation trap. So what he did, he put the lens down and put some particle up and particle has mass m, so force is acting mg down, downwards, and this scattering force is pushing the particle up. So if you can balance this mg with the optical force, the scattering force, which is pushing it away, so balancing gravity with radiation pressure, that is what he wrote in this paper. And that is the first levitation trap he demonstrated with single optical beam, okay? Now down the road, in 1987, 10 years later, he first demonstrated the optical trap of this kind because that time he understood that there is a gradient force which is acting, which can be taken to, a, to, 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 to the advantage. And it can be used to, to balance this scattering force. And eventually with a single beam, no other, uh, I mean, you don't require any other thing with uh, interplay of optics or in some some arrangement of optics you can really do that so that is what is demonstration first demonstrate first use of gradient forces in three dimension he did this was his remarkable paper in 1987 in optics later so so it was a kind of uh, a kind of uh, really really marvel in in science okay and after that he performed lots and lots of experiments on biology and he first in 1988, he showed uh, in vitro fertilization, that concept using optical trap. So very, very phenomenal legendary experiments he did and rest of the world who are following Askin's work, they did. And we also at Ararcat, we did several experiments and we developed several optical tweezers, several variants of optical tweezers using this principle. Now, so far, so good. Okay, now we have learned the theory of physics behind optical tweezers. Now, that is, that is not all. You have to work in the lab. So how will you set up optical tweezers in lab? What are the requirements? So you are talking about forces in the pico-newton range, and you are talking about microparticles. You are talking about displacements or movement of these particles in the nanometer uh, scale. So what is required? First requirement is vibration isolation table. You know, you have to isolate the vibration. You have to get rid of the vibration. And you, what is required is stable vibration fee, robust platform for measurement of pico-neutrons of forces and nanometers of displacements. So that is what is required. So you have to isolate from various environmental sources of noise like temperature fluctuations, acoustic noise, mechanical vibration, air convection, what not. So it is really, really, it is a tough job. And at the same time, you have to have an optical system in the form of inverted microscope. So it is formed by laser coupling from below. So it is inverted microscope. Not normally you have seen in your biology lab, upright microscope. So it is inverted microscope. The light is coming from the bottom, okay? So this is epifluorescence port. That is the epifluorescence port in microscope. Okay, so these are the primary requirements first requirements which come to mind, okay? Now, next you have to consider what should be the wavelength of light and what should be the lens because these two are the major things. So why major things? Blazer, you know that it you can have lasers of various wavelengths in various colors. Now you can have various colors, but how, what the optical trap is, or what the optical trap requires or setting up optical tweezers, what it requires? It requires a wavelength of light which is minimally absorbed by the particle which you want to trap. Why it is so? Because if it is absorbed, then the scattering force will be more, as we have seen already. So it will push the particle away from the laser focus. So you have to have a transparent window, means minimum absorption. 
So there is a, and since it's in the context of biological specimen, you know that this is the region, region of relative transparency around 750 to 1100 nanometer range. This is, this is called the transparent regime. This is the biological regime that this uh, minimum absorption in near infrared regime. So, so commonly used optical trapping, lasers used for optical trapping are NDI laser, which is 1064 nanometer, ND wireless laser, 1047, Junibel type CFL laser, 700 to 1100, infrared diode laser. So these are the common lasers which are used for optical trapping, okay? So not only laser, but you have to focus the laser. And as I told that you have to have a high numerical aperture lens. So no single lens, oil immersion lens I have mentioned, but no single element lens can do your job, no matter what, what you use. So you have to have a compound lens with many opti optical elements there. And this will only be giving you a numerical aperture greater than one for generating a light gradient strong enough for stable trapping in three dimensions. That is what is required, okay? And it will only pause, it, it will only, uh, it will only help you or it will only uh, allow you to, to have a tightly focused incident laser beam. Okay, now, now we have what, what, what only we have set up the optical trap. Let us say we have set up the optical trap. Now you have to steer the beam for manipulation because you are not, you are not doing trapping out of fun. You have to ha apply this thing. So what applications you, what applications do you do unless you can really uh, be able to manipulate uh, the things inside the object. So what we'll do, optical trapping applications, what it will require, the trap to be moved with respect to the specimen, okay? Say for example, when we call specimen, you have an assembly of cells, then if you want to trap a single cell, that cell has to be moved with respect to the rest of the cells. So that is what is required. So how it is possible? No, it is very simple, commonsensical way. Either you can move the stage, that microscope stage, move the stage holding the specimen, whereas optical trap is there and you move the stage. So the, the trap will hold the particle right there, whereas rest of the particles will move alongside the stage, along with the stage, that is the specimen. Or you can move the trap in the specimen plane, okay? You can just move the trap, not the stage. You just hold the trap, hold the, uh, uh, hold the particle and move it. So both the, in either of the ways you can do these things. So if you, for small, accurate and fast displacement in the field of view, that is the focal spot, you have to use this thing, move the trap in the sample specimen place, not the this one. So this can be done either of these two schematics. It is very, I mean, I am not going into detail, but thing is that you can focus the laser beam onto the specimen plane and then you just uh, you just move the stage we, when the trap is there because once the trap is there it will hold the particle there right there or you can the second this thing is possible if you can generate optical trap at various places along the stage so that means you can manipulate or move this trap along the uh, uh, stage so that way the trapped object will be can be moved okay so now, what is the optical tweezer setup schematic? So finally, so you, if you want to set up, you, have, you need to have a laser, then you have to have a beam expander because you know that from laser, you have seen your laser pointer. Many, all of you are aware of laser pointer with which you make the presentation. So that beam coming is very narrow. So you have to expand that beam and then you have to focus it, okay? Then only tight focusing is possible, okay? And then, Whatever is being trapped, you have to see that thing. How will you see? You have to illuminate through white light and you have to place a kind of mirror which reflects this laser beam but passes other than light other than this uh, wavelength of this laser beam. So you can see or you can see this what is being trapped through a CCD camera and appropriate filters. Okay, so this can be done through this kind of thing. So a laser beam, then it is a called 2F system. Okay, so you place this 
place the lenses at its focal lens, okay, respective focal lens, and then you can generate a conjugate geometry here, and you can do this job. So let us see what the design parameters are there. So laser, single mode laser, you need to have single mode laser in NIR region. Lasers have various modes. So you have to choose a single mode, single mode laser, okay? Then beam expander. So expand since you know laser beam is uh, Gaussian profile. So you have to, there is a waste of that beam. So you have to expand laser beam at least two to three times for optical trapping here, okay? Then beam steering mirror. So there are mirrors which will steer the beam. So beam steering mirrors, this say for example, this B and conjugate mirror B prime here and F and P are Fourier conjugate planes. So let us not go into the details of physics, but these Fourier conjugate planes, but you have to have this kind of mirrors. Then light sources and CCD. So imaging, imaging of what is happening, trapping of microscopic objects online. So you have to have appropriate light source, white light source and CCD camera. Then objective, high quality complex optical lens, as I told you, high numerical aperture for tight focusing on laser beam. Then sample stage, manual or motorized transition stage for sample manipulation. So that is available in the microscope, okay? So all of you are aware of microscope. So this is what are the parameters which are required for setting up optical tweezers in a lab, okay? Now, once you set up this optical tweezer in the lab, then you have to characterize it. How will you characterize it? Characterization means you have to really know what is the uh, stiffness constant or what is the force acting on the particle. So how will you do that? Say, for example, let us see. See, a, 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 a particle is uh, a, uh, placed in a fluid which is moving with a velocity V, which is 10 micron per second. That is, the fluid is moving with the 10 micron and along with particle is moving with 10 micron per second speed, okay? So viscous forces are acting on it, as you know, uh, from your again high school physics, that viscosity chapter six pi eta rv, where eta is the viscosity of the fluid medium, r is the radius of this uh, 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 trapped object or uh, the object, and uh, v is the velocity of the fluid flow velocity. So what happens, you know? Now it is flowing. Say for example, this is a kind of situation. Now I put the optical trap. So this is happening and then optical trap I just placed. So what will happen? It cannot move because it will be trapped, okay? Now, while it is in trap, it will undergo Brownian motion. That's why it will oscillate. It, 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 has, it, it is basically, it always undergoes Brownian motion because of this temperature fluctuation. So it will have, it will have Brownian motion, but see, it is not being able to escape from the optical trap, okay? And here, because V is here 10 micron, Per second. Now let us see what happens if I if I increase the speed. Now if I increase the speed of this thing, then it will vigorously oscillate there. Okay, see it is vigorously oscillating there again because see that the fluid this this viscous force here viscous force is uh, sorry viscous force is acting when it is placed here and it is moving uh, in this way, so it is trying to moving uh, 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 away, viscous flows, what is happening, it is basically pushing it away, okay? And uh, so that's why what is happening ultimately, Brownian motion and viscous force, that viscous force basically is pushing it away. And this F, this F, that viscous force is then balancing that thing. That's why Brownian motion, due to Brownian movement, it is pulling, pushing, pushing, it is getting push, pushed off, okay? So this trap stiffness is determined, it is called escape velocity measurement. That is the velocity which at which the particle will just escape the trap. So that is how this, this thing is uh, uh, calculated. Then you equate this, uh, F with the KX and you know the viscous force, then you can know the K. And if you know the K, then you can really know the force. Okay, displacement you know. So this is how optical trap, uh, this is how the you can calibrate the measurement of force. Now, another way this can be done is that if you want very, very accurate thing, so what will happen? 
say for example, for a laser power of 5 milliwatt, say it is oscillating here, okay? Now, according to thermodynamics, if you really uh, consider thermodynamics, then you know that half of K average, X squared average is nothing but half KT. K is the Boltzmann's constant, T is the temperature. So that means you, it is called equipartition theorem in thermodynamics. So if you equate this, this thing, then, and if you plot this, 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 see, you are, you have trapped this particle, but it is moving. So if you just, uh, uh, with time, if you just uh, uh, plot this Brownian displacement, Brownian motion displacement, which is in nanometer, you have this kind of fluctuation. And if you plot this fluctuation, you can see it is a kind of graph, this thing. So maximum is here, and then gradually it is waning away at the two uh, 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 ends okay so with a laser beam of laser power of 5 milliwatt now see what happens if i increase the laser power so if i increase the laser power then this oscillation the magnitude of the oscillation is reduced see its magnitude of oscillation reduced and here it, from this equipartition theorem you can again calculate and you can see that 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 steep so, so the the magnitude of this displacement is much narrow or it is much smaller so with increase of optical power, with uh, laser power, you can you can uh, make the uh, stable trap. Okay, so you can and you can determine the force by equipartition theorem using these equations. Now more accurate measurement is possible by Langevin dynamics. That is that is the equation. I will not go into detail because this is the uh, this is the differential equation which is solved in Fourier plane. And what happens is that there is C, this, this thing is uh, fluctuating and you can have solution like this. And ultimately the objective is that you, you have to know the force which is acting on it. So that is how you will calibrate the force. So, so up to this, you have seen that after this thing, single optical trap, we have now understood how we can form rough, at least some idea or feel you must be having right uh, 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 by now how a single beam optical trap can be formed and how at least some parameters can be measured. Now, advanced, advanced optical trapping modalities. So it is called holographic optical tweezers. Till now we have been talking about single optical trap, means a, sing, a single laser beam is coming and you are focusing it high in the objective you are basically generating an optical trap and there you are manipulating the thing. But in many a situation, what you want is multiple optical trap. You want to simultaneously trap many objects. Okay, how it is possible? Then that means you have to set up various optical traps, various lasers, whether that is advisable or that is recommended or it is desirable, no. So what will do then? you will do what you will do it is a simple method for creating multiple optical tweezers from a single laser beam that is by hologram you know hologram you have all aware of this word hologram okay what it what it does is a phase a phase uh, imaging of that particular thing what it does i will not go into the physics of holography okay but how it now nowadays computer generated diffractive optical elements uh, this HOT I am abbreviating as holographic optical tweezers. They use computer generated diffractive optical element to split the laser beam into several separate beams. So a computer controlled liquid crystal spatial light modulator. This spatial light modulator, it projects a series of holograms. Basically, I will, I will try to explain you. These holograms redesign the pattern of the tweezers and HOT uses a reflective spatial light modulator to diffract the beam. So essentially what is being written here is that, that you want to, what you have to, what you have to do, you have to separate uh, or you have to split this laser beam into very many spots or very many laser beams, same from the same laser beam. So that is what is the job of special light modulator. Reflecting special light, light modulator means you will shine the laser beam onto this, uh, uh, special light modulator or SLM and the light which is coming out will have uh, that, 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 that will be of several beams. Okay, so this is how it happens. So I have 
this is a special light modulator. Laser beam is happening. So single mode laser is falling. And I have shown only two. So these two, uh, that, that could be multiple, depending on how you are forming this computer pattern, hologram pattern. And you can have multiple spots at the uh, object plane. So, so this is the thing uh, we, which you have generated in our lab. So you can have, you can play around with patterns. So this is the pattern we generated, one of the patterns. So this is the, there are several uh, multiple traps, okay? And 3D array of independently controllable trapping sites, which can be dynamically reconfigured in real time. So that is the advantage of holographic optical tweezers. What is the advantage? Advantage is that you can have independent optical traps, okay? So advantage I'm telling you, so you can have measurement of cell elasticity using multiple traps. For example, here, viscous elasticity you have measured in this kind of red blood cell. So you, you set this multiple three optical trap here. So you just, since they're independent, you can pull the two traps while one trap is fixed. They are pulling from different ways. So right, by doing that, you can measure the force and you can study the cell viscous elasticity, which you have studied in our lab. So cell sorting using optical trap arrays, specimen beam, special beam profiles, you can generate basal beam, lago Gaussian beam, et cetera. Okay, so these are many things you can play around basically. Now, I will show you the selected applications in biology, which we have done in our lab first, okay? So it is a 3D rotation, which otherwise is not possible. By any means, you cannot do that without optical trap. So this is a, this is the chloroplast in Elodia densa plant cell. You know, so Elodia densa, you all of you know that they, they, they grow in uh, water, ponds, etc. So this is the chloroplast, they're moving in 3D. So optical trap, you are setting optical trap to rotate it in 3D plane, a 2D plane, okay? So any birefringent objects like chloroplast or RBCs, we can rotate on rotating plane of polarization of optical trapping beam. Forget about polarization and all these things. So basically you have to, in the, uh, using optical trapping, you can do these jobs. And we, this, this was published in Optics and Photonics News in 2003, right way back in 2003. Also, we have an Indian patent on this thing. Similarly, red blood cell rotation, you, you can see by rotating the polarization of trap beam. So, so if you just rotate the polarization of the trapping beam, you can rotate the RBC. Okay, so this also we showed for the first time and it got published in Optics Experience 2005. Okay, now second application which we did, uh, we showed rotation of cellular assembly, right? Till now we talk about single cell. Now let us say there is a uh, assembly, assembly of cells you want to rotate. How it is possible? Instead of spherical lens, you use cylindrical lens, which forms a line line focus. So if you if you uh, tightly focus a laser beam onto a line, that on a line you can really uh, trap a series of cells or series of objects, okay? So that is how you can really uh, 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 gather the cells and you can rotate them, okay? So this, this was also published in Optics Photonics News, okay? Now selected applications uh, uh, in another optically controlled rotation is 3D rotation, which is showed. 3D rotation, no other thing can, I mean, can uh, show this kind of thing. You know that normally uh, in a microscope, you do the, you see the 2D image of, a, of an object, but if you want to see the other part of it, so you have to rotate the object. So that is what is happening here. So we have shown that using optical trap, you can rotate an object in three dimension, okay? So what, how it, it was done? So you have trapped this thing. So there is net force is zero. Then you use a pulse laser and then you tweak at, or you just uh, 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 prod this, uh, this, this object. Then it starts rotating uh, because of inertia. So that is what is happening here. Okay, so that, that is what has happened just like this. So you just, this, this, this arrow, it is nothing but the direction of the a pulse laser, which is basically shown on that uh, trapped cylinder, which is uh, uh, which, which has been trapped by optical so other optical beams. Okay, laser beams. So that is how it is happening. So here you can see uh, uh, 
malaria diagnosis one 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 uh, possible uh, application which we could think of that time is that way back in 2004 5 that self rotation of rbc so it could probably diagnose of malaria though we have not pursued on this uh, 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 pursue studies in this direction. So what happened, you know, let me tell you the gist of this uh, uh, result is that, so normal RBCs, you can see it is basically uh, spinning very rapidly, quickly you can see. So these RBCs are put in a uh, isotonic solution. There is all concentration outside is higher than the inside cell concentration. So due to osmosis, the cell deformity take place. And so, uh, normal RBCs, they they started rotating just like in a windmill, whereas a malaria infected, that is plasmodium infected RBC, their speed of rotation was much less. So this particular, this thing we showed uh, and uh, we, we published this thing and this, this uh, uh, finding, even Professor Askin in one of his uh, lectures, he has He's, he's, uh, he has got several awards. So in his one of his uh, lectures, you can find in YouTube, he mentioned about these things, about he devoted one paragraph on this thing that one Indian group has uh, uh, shown uh, the this kind of, uh, this uh, rotation of uh, uh, normal and malaria affected RVCs. And when I say Indian, this is not American Indian, it is Indian Indian. So he has a uh, 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 total paragraph devoted to, to our work, okay? So that is how. So another application is optical transport, okay? So we have optical gun, you can have optical transport in a plane transverse to the trap beam. So trap beam, uh, you can see that transport takes place. So you have, you can see this for how it happens. Similarly, you know, intracellular transport in interest in inside cell, there is transport takes place of material from one uh, region to the other region. So trapping multiple organelles, here chloroplast, LOD and then sublan cell. So you have, uh, you, we have shown that thing. So all these things were published and I mean, uh, Okay, now we have also patents on this. So now another application which we uh, shown, which has shown long back is that laser guided enhancement of neural neuronal growth cones. You know that a neuron, if you trap at one some end, then in that trapped uh, optical trap, uh, uh, location of that optical trap, the other materials of the neuron, they just growth materials of the neuron, they just come attracted towards that. So that is how uh, this, when these growth materials come there, so there is a kind of neural growth. So you can basically manipulate using this laser or optical strap, this uh, neural growth. So that we shown the, we have shown the possibility of this thing and that was published in optics later in 2005. Now I will show some applications of uh, optical trap, not our work, but a phenomenal work by which was published in science so that is determination of coiling forces of a DNA molecule. Okay, you know the DNA is a coiled molecule. So what they did, they used optical uh, trapping and they used this uh, uh, microsphere, which they coated with some some chemical, which will uh, which will bind this DNA one end and another end also they have coated on the uh, stage and there is so basically the two ends of the DNA, they tied with these things through chemical method. And now they have put the whole thing in optical trap. Okay, now the sphere in optical trap. So you can, you can see that when it is the main position and as the main, from the main position one goes away on uh, in both the directions, you can, you can basically measure. And at some point in time, you can see the force is increasing and at some point it is decreasing. So using these things, they have shown that as DNA molecule is uncoiled, the forces required for uncoiling are determined from displacement of the bead from the trap center. So you can, I mean, you can uh, understand that if, if, it, if it is away, so you can, I mean, you have to basically stretch the coiling uh, string, uh, in between string, to, to uh, understand what is the uh, coiling force. 
So this they have shown and in science paper. Another in very interesting from a biology point of view, you know that in a, inside a cell, you have interstate highways like thing. So inside a cell, from one part of the cell to the other part of the cell, the materials or things, how they move. There it is, it is known now that there, but this is possible by this a motor molecule called kinesin. Okay, so they, what they do, see, this is the interstate highway. They basically uh, 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 take small steps and do these things, just like a small baby does this thing. So they basically transport the material from one end to the other. So these vesicles, for example, they have vesicles are transported within the cell by intercellular highways of microtubules. There are microtubules along which they, that those are the interstate highways like thing or they are intracellular highways in this case. So they are joining this uh, and along these highways, these kinesin molecules, which are motor molecules, they do this job. So that is that has been shown by this group, by two groups, one is uh, they, they publish this thing, Nature London and in science. Okay, this is very, very phenomenal work. And so they, they uh, this is very fundamental work in biology. Now, Sorry. Now, another application of uh, optical tweezer is that those are those, the applications so far I have told talked about is directly using or manipulating the trapped object. Now, another thing can be done to to really know about the biochemistry of the trapped object or trapped biological cells or any biological organelle. What can be done? You have to basically. Uh, combine optical tweezers with optical spectroscopy. So that is the application, Raman optical tweezers. It is optical tweezers assisted spectroscopy of single cells. If you want to do spectroscopy of single cells for knowing what biochemical events are happening there. So because everything is biochemistry. So you want to know and you know that Raman spectroscopy is a vibrational spectroscopic technique, which is very much molecular specific and you can have molecular information of the trapped cell or a trapped biological entity by using Raman spectroscopy and with optical tweezers. And by combining Raman spectroscopy, optical tweezers, which we call Raman optical tweezers. So basically you trap this object and you do Raman spectroscopy from a single cell at the different points, special points. So, so say for example, this is the RBC, single RBC, deoxygenated and oxygenated. This is RBC Raman spectra. Normally, if you try to record Raman spectra of any such entities, you you uh, you will have to have a kind of uh, population of cells. But in a single cell, it is possible with the help of optical trapping. So, what is what is the advantage of doing that? Okay. So, even otherwise, you can you can say that we can even uh, we can immobilize the single cell onto the slide, and then you can do. But if you do uh, in, in a trap cell vis-a-vis -vis with that in a, on a slide, what will, the, what will be the uh, advantage? So advantage you'll have that you have uh, basically low signal to noise ratio because otherwise why it will have? Because the background, your background where uh, will be less air because you, you have optical trap and you can isolate the if a trapped entity, say for example, single RBC here, you can just isolate it from the other cell population, even with, from the substrate. Whereas in, uh, in, in, in immobilized thing, you cannot do that. So background Raman signature will interfere. So here you will have, uh, uh, so, so, so you have high SNR in optical trap, whereas low SNR is possible because of long acquisition time in, traditional methods. So it is it improves the center by enabling long acquisition times and minimize background interferences. So that is the advantage why we do optical trapping of single cells or, or Raman spectroscopy of optically trapped single cell. Now, when we do that, we have we have done several applications on lab using Raman spectroscopy of single cells. Okay. So one of the method is one of one of the applications is you know that nowadays all of us use mobile phones. So there was a paper in Scientific American which shows that new studies link cell phone radiation with cancer. 
so there are several myths several uh, uh, you know conjectures several opinions about the use of cell phone and with many people think that it is it can cause cancer it does so but nobody knows the correct answer because all the conjectures are some kind of uh, you know that just myths so we did this thing what we did is that we took rbcs and we used uh, two cell phones one of bsnl and another is airtel as you know that bsnl works in 900 megahertz and 1800 megahertz is airtel so we put this cell phone radiation on uh, to uh, to two rbcs several rbcs and we found that after 60 minute of uh, 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 exposure to these radiations uh, what happens you know that the rbcs get deoxygenated these are the spectra which are raman spectra control subtracted raman spectra and these are the bands which are basically deoxygenation signatures of uh, rbcs these are the raman uh, uh, regimes which indicate deoxygenation so you can see with respect to control deoxygenation is much higher so basically raman uh, 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 this this rbcs they 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 get deoxygenated uh, on cell phone for 60 minutes on cell phone uh, if you put it under cell phone radiation for 60 minutes so we wanted to corroborate with further further uh, uh, from alternate studies so what we found that you know this is the uh, this is the phase image phase image of an rbc and this is this is what is represents the thickness of the rbc okay and this is basically the membrane of rbc and you can see that membrane is dynamically changing with the because we have imaged it uh, at several frames okay so what it shows is that basically when this uh, shape changes so that means there is some kind of deoxygenation taking place so this morphological change is associated with deoxygenation and raman spectra also shows deoxygenation so both are pointing towards the same thing so basically deoxygenation is taking place so what is happening so we have shown that uh, in in the thickness is a measure of deoxygenation here uh, in 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 this experiment so we have uh, radial distance versus mean thickness we have plotted you can see that with 900 megahertz the mean thickness has increased so thickness increase that means morphological change is associated with that thing so that means mobile signal alter metabolic activities of cells by activation of this uh, this thing and membranes uh, calcium channels how we have found that we just uh, uh, tag these things with fluorophore that fluorophore that one uh, fluorescent dye is there which will bind with the calcium and so we have after putting it in trap we just measured that uh, fluorescent signal from that tagged uh, uh, calcium uh, or uh, that that fluorophore fluorophore okay so it shows that it is calcium ion is much more or that that means the fluorescence is very intense okay so this thing uh, basically indicate that mobile signals alter metabolic activities of cells by activation of membrane calcium channel calcium ion channels now interestingly what we found is that after two and a half hours or two hours roughly this is reversible this is not irreversible so the uh, you know that you can you, you you will experience this thing that if you uh, talk for a long time in mobile with your phone uh, placed uh, near your ear then there is the same kind of heat you can uh, some kind of uh, temperature you, you will feel so that is basically because of these things deoxygenation and other things and then if you uh, move it away then it again becomes normal so that is the thing so that is what we observed another application which we did is that effect of morphological uh, uh, changes in hemoglobin oxygen affinity with shape variations of rbc you know that normally rbcs are donut shaped discoside it is called but in some disease conditions either it become echinocyte echinocyte it is called or stromatocyte okay so this is uh, we we took this kind of cells and we uh, studied the oxygen hemoglobin oxygen affinity under optical trap and we found that this uh, deoxygenation is more 
when in echinocytes, and that is basically we could relate with ATP depletion. The detail of these things, you can study the paper, which is here in the reference, our paper. So what is happening is that, uh, what we uh, plotted here is that this, uh, this band of Raman versus this band of Raman, this is 1212 centimeter turn band is the basically deoxygenation signature band and 1224 is the oxygenation. So you can see that deoxygenation is much more in echinocytes. Whereas here also it 1248 versus 1212 band we have shown, it shows the morphological deformation. So morphological deformation is associated with echinocytes. So you can see here, even Raman spectra also uh, give you the same thing because there is morphological deformation in echinocytes, everybody knows. So that is how we can relate all our findings to the uh, uh, actual thing. So changes in Raman signals of optical ultraviolet RBCs can demonstrate that oxy deoxy states and hence cell conditions, okay? Now another application, just I am giving you uh, uh, some applications to give you a feel of what optical trap can do or the power of optical trapping or Raman optical tweezers in this case. So this is a very recent paper. So what we did is that, you know, that uh, we wanted to study the behavior of RBCs in postprandial acute short-term hyperglycemic scenario. You have taken meal and you normally you do postprandial uh, uh, glucose measurement, okay? So to simulate that thing, what we did is that we human RBCs, we took and we exposed it to varying concentration of glucose from five millimolar to 40 uh, uh, millimolar in vitro for durations of three hours as occurs in postprandial scenario in diabetic and pre-diabetic individuals. So this, this, this is, we wanted to simulate that thing. So how do we found that if you uh, just uh, see the Raman spectra of these three things, the bottom one, the black one is the normal control. And this is, uh, mm, these are the two, two uh, uh, cases uh, of different uh, mole uh, five millimolar and 40 mil uh, millimolar uh, glucose exposure whereas there is no glucose exposure in the black case, you will see there are some changes here in this band. And when we uh, normal subtracted spectra, it is, and you can see that really there are changes in this region. And this is the region of oxygenation, okay? Indicative of oxygenation, okay? What we understood is that increasing oxygen affinity with increasing glycemic exposure. That means with, uh, more glucose concentration or more glucose uh, glycemic exposure, you have uh, these RBCs have increasing oxygen affinity. And that is basically uh, that we have done with another optical trapping experiments with that thing, uh, optical stretcher experiment, when is a normal one. And with glucose that uh, uh, we have stretched it, glucose, uh, this thing. And you can see that here in the reverse way, zero glucose to uh, higher glucose concentration, this elongation is less. That means the cell loses its elasticity. And that is because of this oxygenation. This oxygenation basically damages its cell membrane. Okay. So that is what we did. And we confirmed this thing. So this was published in European Journal of Biophysics in recently. And now, uh, uh, so that is a higher glycolytic flask uh, leads to possible oxidative intracellular environments, which then risks age, uh, hemoglobin oxidation and consequent membrane oxidation. So that is what the conclusion is. So now, uh, so far we have talked about uh, the different applications which we have done in our lab. And also we have shown two uh, applications done elsewhere on uh, of optical trap on DNA recoiling, course calculation, and also kinase in motor uh, in intracellular pathway. Uh, so now let us pose this question that so far we have talked about optical trapping of dielectric particle. What is dielectric particle uh, commonly uh, uh, perceived? It is, the, the physics says dielectric particle. What do we mean by that? Non-conducting particle, okay? It doesn't conduct and it is transparent so-called, okay? It can riff, it, it, it through which light can pass. Okay, so that is the electric particle, okay, or dielectric medium per se. But you know that a metal piece, if you put a metal piece in the path of light, it will block the light. It will reflect the light, rather. It, no light will pass through. Why that is so? So let us see why 
that is so and whether a metal microparticle instead of dielectric microparticle whether that can they can be trapped see sorry so they cannot be trapped trapping is not possible why because all the light will be reflected there will be no refraction and as i told you in uh, earlier slides that that should be gradient force this this reflection will only lead to scattering force which is repulsive in nature so it will push the particle away from its uh, uh, focal spot or away from the beam so so this is not possible because scattering force is more than gradient force now why it is so why why they reflect they reflect because you know when you shine any beam of light these electrons that you you know that metals have free electrons they are these metals free electrons are in their conduction band okay so you have you you, you can uh, i mean many of you have that uh, uh, you can remember uh, those things that they have the met in metal the electrons are there in the conduction band and there is a kind of uh, uh, sea of electrons like that free electrons so what is happening again you see that this this electrons which oscillates here that is this is called plasma oscillations okay this plasma oscillations the frequencies of this thing is exactly resonating with the uh, beam which is falling and that's why they are basically getting reflected or uh, scattered so this is what is the thing and this this dimension is uh, greater than micron micron dimension okay so delta p that is f scattering is dominating that's why it is not gradient force is not there or very little i will say why then trapping is not possible now you can see is it possible to uh, do this thing uh, metal micro particles there is a thing when a laser beam falls on these things or light beam falls on these things apart from this events another thing happens that laser beam it is not true that it is completely reflected there is a portion called evanescent due to evanescent wave there is some wave uh, they they leak through the metal and they they penetrate around tens of uh, tens of nanometer depth that is called skin depth in physics it is called skin depth so metal has that skin depth okay due to evanescent wave now in a micron this evanescent wave is the skin depth due to this evanescent wave that means uh, uh, in subsurface around 10 nanometer subsurface there is uh, this uh, effect of this uh, light the electric electric field is there so but this particles are micro particles means micron size and it is nanometer so it is much more dimension is much more so scattering force is there because i told you that for trapping anything you have to have refraction if only reflection is there there will be only scattering force okay so there is no refraction in this case now if i reduce the size of this particles metal particles to nano regime then what will happen then there will be evanescent wave okay there will be evanescent wave but this even skin depth due to this evanescent wave will be larger than this nano particles now because this tens of if you can reduce it to uh, uh, tens of this thing the size of this nan, uh, metal particles then some portion of the thing will pass through that is refraction will take place so skin depth has to be greater than the dimension of the nano particle so then gradient force will be greater than this scattering force and trapping will be possible so normally normally you cannot trap a metal particle using optical trap unless its dimension is in the nanometer regime so that is how uh, you can trap normally if you ask anybody that whether you can trap a metal microparticle or metal particle the answer will be no but you have to accept it with a pinch of salt you have to say that yes it is possible when the skin depth is much higher than the dimension of the metal particle which you want to trap that is in the nanometer regime then trapping is possible so we use this particular thing uh, to to do a one experiment uh, you know that uh, with raman spectroscopy it is called nano trap enhanced raman spectroscopy we abbreviated at ntrs we propose this thing one of my uh, dr majumda yes uh sir uh, it's been more than an hour so so i will just uh, i will yeah. just finish yeah. it
Is thank the last you. transparency. Okay, thank you. So, so this is nano trap enhanced Raman spectroscopy. And so uh, what is happening here, you know that using Raman spectroscopy, we wanted to measure the analyte concentration in biofluids. And using Raman spectroscopy, it is very, very uh, difficult because these analytes, bioanalytes have very low Raman cross-section, means they do not have sufficient Raman signal to be detected. So signal enhancement is required. So normally, you may be aware of surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy or dry coating deposition Raman spectroscopy. They are the techniques which are used for enhancing the Raman signal. What we have done here is that we uh, shown the laser beam here, and we uh, uh, we mix these nanoparticles with the analyte in aqua solution and made them dry on its own. So what happened? You know that this laser at the laser focal spot, these metal particles they were basically getting uh, trapped, and at the same time, you know, due to coffee ring effect, you know that when you uh, spill. Uh, coffee on the floor even and let it uh, dry, get dried up, then you will see that there is a pattern. And if you carefully observe that pattern, you'll find that at the periphery, you have more solute concentration and the con uh, uh, density of that solute is basically waning away if you uh, uh, come to the center. So that is what happens here. At the, along the periphery, due to coffee ring effect, the analyte is getting, uh, analyte is moving uh, towards that thing at the same time, uh, there is a cluster of nanoparticles that is because of this optical trapping. And from there, if you measure now Raman signal, it order of magnitude Raman uh, signal enhancement happens. So we proposed this thing and it was published in Anandemic Chemistry in 2019. Okay, so that is how uh, we did. And with this, using this technique, it is possible to uh, measure the concentration of different analyzes present in present in body fluid at physiological concentration, which otherwise is not possible using conventional Raman spectroscopy. So I think I finish here. That is the end last slide we had, I had. So now I, before I finish, I would acknowledge our present and past members of this laser biomedical application division at RRCAT. And particularly, I would like to thank Onike Choudhury, Dr. Raktim Das Gupta, one of our PhD students, Jasri Singh, Dr. Samarendra Kumar Mohanty, who was very instrumental in setting up optical trapping lab in our uh, optical trapping lab at uh, in our division, who is there in USA now. Dr. Surjendu Vikas Dutta is another one of our PhD students who did uh, this NTERS study and who is now doing postdoc in uh, Germany. And Dr. Rashmi Srivastava, and uh, uh, who has contributed equally in this uh, optical uh, NTERS. And last but not the least, I would like to thank Dr. S. V. Nakhe, Shankar Vinayak Nakhe, our director, for his keen interest and support to run our activities. Thank you very much.